great honor to be invited um, to talk on such an interesting issue of the intersection of um, open source and AI. Maybe people can call that open source AI. Um, here's Steph in the back. Come on up, Steph. Good to see you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> well, um, so I, I, like, I, like I mentioned, I'll, I'll invite people to introduce themselves in a second. I'm Justin Colonino. I'm here today uh, representing um, GitHub um, and their developer policy team that you know, advocates for policy globally um, to uh, advance uh, software development, in particular open source um, software development. I also uh, am an associate general counsel at Microsoft, I'm working on open source software law, and I'm on the board of the Open, open Source Initiative. Um, so lots of different hats. Um, I just wanted to make a few remarks. Uh, I, I was really impressed with the morning's panel so far, and I really view it as uh, a testament to the success of open source. Um, really, uh, and, I, and I say this kind of you know, ducking a little bit as a, from uh, the Microsoft perspective, but, but you know, open source won. Um, it's ubiquitous across software development now. Um, the world has come around to the idea that uh, transparency, collaborative improvement, autonomy, and the freedom to use code for any purpose drives innovation and allows us all to learn and build upon what came before. We heard about that in so many different ways um, this morning. Um, a driving light of that has been the open source definition. Um, and the reason, and what that definition really embodies is removing the barriers to sharing. Um, 40 years ago when the first, I call it a proto-MIT license, I'm a lawyer so I'm going to devolve into that for just a second, a proto-MIT license was, was written, some, some, some folks came to an unknown lawyer in the MIT tech transfer office and said, hey, we want to share this code. Any problem with that? And they said, well, uh, how do we do that? And, the, and the, the lawyer wrote a very simple license that said you have broad rights under copyright law and intellectual property laws more generally. And by the way, we need a limitation of liability because we don't know where this code's going to go or how it's going to be used. And that's why we see that big, bold text at the end of every open source license that says you take this and do what you want with it, but don't come after me. And so the idea was let's remove the barriers and liability um, to sharing. Um, and, and removing that enables amazing innovation. It permits frictionless, zero marginal cost reproduction. Once written, it goes everywhere and can help anyone um, and it drives innovation in Europe and, and throughout the world. But now that we've won, there's huge responsibility that comes alongside it. People have questions about security. People have questions about product liability when these things go into, um, when they go everywhere. You know, what's the, what's the liability for the people building the products? Um, and we've just had a, a cycle of regulation in Europe and, 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 other where, and other places kind of thinking about what's the right uh, responsibilities, more barriers to sharing to put on to um, the software industry generally and open source in particular. And I think it's a testament to uh, Open Forum Europe and the hard work of so many others in the room that um, we've come out with solutions that don't uh, impose too many new barriers on that sharing and, and promote that cycle of innovation. Um, and, and the one thing I want to say is the fact that people are, are kind of understanding that open innovation cycle, I think is a testament itself. It was a dream 10 years ago when this um, you know, conference was started that, that people would be talking about open source and open source innovation everywhere, and in particular in um, areas like um, artificial intelligence. And, and thinking about the benefits that open source brings. And, and just, we've, we've heard a, a lot about the, you know, the trillion dollar uh, demand side number, 8.8 .8 trillion. I just want to put that in perspective for one second. That's three times the market cap of Microsoft. And of course, Microsoft also is a zero marginal cost goods company, right? We write platforms and those platforms are driven everywhere and we sell them and, and, and everybody you know, derives value from them. But you know, the, the fact that open source is valued at you know, three times that amount, I think is very interesting. And I think the difference might be the fact that open source has that permissionlessness to it. 
It's still zero marginal cost innovation. Once it's written, it can be sent everywhere, but it's permissionless and it can be, anybody can pick it up and, and derive value from it. So, right, sorry, we're here to talk about AI. What does that mean for AI? What does that mean for AI? Um, I just want to highlight two things about uh, why we've won in AI, in open source AI. Um, at the very beginning, most AI developers immediately started putting random open source licenses on their stuff. It was great. Right away, and now you can go online and there are ML models available everywhere. Um, about 500,000 on, on one, one site called Hugging Face, and that number's been doubling every six months. If we come back in a year, I'd expect there to be um, just shy of two million. And um, uh, now we're considering how you know, regulation can support and remove barriers to sharing to allow open innovation in AI, but also thinking about kind of the security um, uh, and safety issues that we've talked, seen in software that I think people are thinking might be a little bit bigger um, um, in the AR space. So with those introductory remarks, we have some really interesting questions and a really experienced panel. I just want, if everybody could go down the line and just introduce yourself, there are mics in front of you. Introduce yourself very briefly, one minute, who you are, where you're from, and then we'll, we'll begin um, with some questions. Um, I'll start from here. Stefan Mafulli, I'm the executive director of the Open Source Initiative. I'm Arne Loos, I'm part of the Open Technology Group at IBM. I'm an open standards, open source specialist. I've been doing open source since 1990. Hello, uh, my name is Jordanka Ivanova. I'm, I'm legal and policy officer in the European Commission in uh, DigiConnect, uh, working uh, on artificial intelligence and in particular the Artificial Intelligence Act. Um, um, and uh, I'm very happy to be and uh, replace here my head of unit who unfortunately had an accident uh, and was not able to come. Uh, but um, uh, we are very interested in the debate and want to contribute. I'm Brian Bellendorf. I'm chief AI strategist for the Linux Foundation as well as I wear a hat as CTO for the Open Wallet Foundation, another Linux Foundation project. Uh, and uh, have also been in open source a long, long time. Hi, I am Mia Petra Kumpula Natri, member of the European Parliament. I am coming from Finland. Uh, my engineering diploma is from 1995, and since then I have been doing politics more than uh, technics. So please, uh, when you go for the technicalities in the questions, I know more on the legislative trials to put the great, great trials for the future. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Um, so before we get to those really interesting um, you know, policy questions, legislative questions. It might be helpful to break down AI a little bit um, and think about how it's similar to source code and how it might be a little bit different. Um, you know, Steph, you've been doing a deep dive in OSI, um, as you and I know because we work there. Um, <laughs> what have you found as you've gone through uh, that process? I, we, we started thinking uh, at, about AI because we definitely we immediately realized that it contains new artifacts. It's a, it looks similar, but it's deceivingly similar. We noticed how the, the pipeline to build an AI system is, uh, including, new, is including new elements that the, the, uh, what software is made of is, is slightly different, and um, it creates new artifacts that for which we don't have, there, there is no immediately visible what the legal frameworks are, and I'd be specific. So on, on one hand, you have, uh, especially machine learning, requires data on the, uh, on the ingestion front. And when you start to, to deal with data, all of a sudden, you, um, as a developer, you start getting into, dragged into conversations around privacy or terms of use and, and other new legislation and legal frameworks that are not, um, that are not homologated, that are not similar across different parts of the world, and, and that's a, a big challenge. Uh, once the, the data is used in the machine, fed into machine and, and for training, it generates new artifacts. These new artifacts, model weights, they have, may, may have heard the term. Uh, the, these uh, parameters and these th new things are the results of this training elaboration. There is no, in the legal uh, communities around the world, there is no uh, immediate 
uh, natural understanding whether those fall under copyright law or they require new new laws. So my my first impression when I went started playing with uh, with these new machines uh, and I went to look at Hugging Face, I noticed uh, a lot of the licenses that be that were being used. There are licenses that are being written for with copyright in mind. And my, my question to my board and other legal experts I know is like, oh, so how how do you, how do you feel about that? So when I started sensing these um, um, lack of alignment, I asked um, the, the wider community, uh, that's the role of the o open source initiative is to, to be a convener of conversation. So we, we started asking, what does it mean? And we're driving now this conversation, we've been doing it for over a year, to understand exactly what open source AI means. And we, we, we are go getting towards a, uh, a conclusion, hopefully, by the end of this year, we're gonna have uh, an understanding. The, um, the, the main question that we need to find an answer for is what is the preferred form to make modifications to an AI system? In, or, in other words, how do you change the outputs given the, given the input that you, as a user, wanna give? And, and ultimately, we wanna have we really want to drive a shared understanding because we believe that AI systems uh, deserve the same sort of permissionless, frictionless innovation that has driven this immense value that open source software had. Thanks, Steph. And that, and that idea um, of preferred form of making modifications really has been kind of a touchstone of open source in the past so that people can pick things up and have that frictionless improvement and innovation cycle that we talked about at the beginning. But, but maybe um, zooming way out now to, to kind of, you know, the kind of other side of AI perhaps. Um, you know, since uh, generative AI kind of took the world by storm uh, in the past two years or so, um, there's been an ongoing discussion, debate, uh, about perceived dangers in having machines that are able to kind of synthesize and generate text and pictures and video and code and descriptions of chemical, uh, new, new chemical agents, biological compounds. Um, Yordanka, Mia Pietra, uh, as policymakers, how do you consider these, um, how do you consider the, the, you know, this debate as you think about um, legislation around AI? Yes, first of all, we uh, were prepared. In the parliament, we also had this special uh, group uh, of ADA, uh, AI in the Digital Age, that worked for over a year, and we heard like hundreds of uh, specialists to get a glue what we should then later legislate, and the commission was doing its own proposal at the same time. So when we had the proposal, we were even ready. And I was very, I don't even remember everything by heart, but I was very happy when I had the invitation here, so I find the old uh, IDA committee study requested by IDA committee challenge and limits of an open source approach to AI. So I said, oh my God, I have to read this quickly. <laughs> so uh, the first thing that uh, politicians do not understand, it's not time to regulate something that we don't even have, and it has changed now. Now we are criticized that you are legislating too late. It's too <laughs> late that today the council should uh, do the AI act and approve it. And also I think that the uh, USA got bits faster with the executive order order that yes, something has to be re registered, the risk-based system is agreed globally that it is the good way to look at the how they, uh, the for what AI is used, so it's not technology that we try to legislate, it is the use cases and risk-based idea. So uh, I think that the appetite on the political life and more understanding and, and very much needed public debate came along when uh, it came more publicly that you can have your mobile phone and have uh, AI systems to test a little bit or your 15 year old is happy that the teacher doesn't know when they, they have not read the book but only used uh, some language models to make their answer on the book they didn't read but then kind of created own text. So now it's everywhere and I think the political response needs to be that it's going to the good direction, it's still some democratic control, there should be some possibilities to, to see where and how new technologies are used. And then one specific was also that, of course, the generative AI was not on the commission proposal, Parliament required it. It was the last topic to be accepted also by the Council, because Parliament didn't want to accept it without. And 
I don't know technically or even in the articles how successful that is, that is the commission to implement more. But then at the same time, it cannot be that if you are uh, in charge of something you are doing on the markets, that the big players or the open, uh, 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 the generative systems behind many use cases are not responsible at all, but then all, only the smaller players, inventors, companies, they have to be if they use this for the risk basis. So it's as simple as that. The political will was quite clear in the parliament where to go to. And I just mentioned here very shortly, we can later come back to that. We also had the understanding in the beginning of this term that AI is only about data. So where to get data? So I was happy to be the rapporteur of the data strategy for the parliament in the term. So we wanted to break that booze. So when you are an owner of an equipment, connected equipment, it doesn't create data if you don't use it. So if you use it, should the value only go for the owner or builder of the machine? Or should that be the new economy for Europe, the data economy, that more data will be available for more users, for more innovations, and even for the uh, equipment user? So this has been like some motivation in the, this term in the majority of the parliament to push forward innovative uh, possibilities to use European data. Maybe uh, I can also complement that indeed we, Europe has been one of the leading uh, forces to both promote the benefits of artificial intelligence, uh, its uh, use, because we do believe in the great potential uh, it has to improve our lives, uh, to promote competitiveness of our companies, um, and at the same time also address uh, the ethical issues, ensure that these systems are trustworthy, safe, uh, and uh, it's been at the basis with these two objectives that we proposed, uh, as was said uh, quite some years ago, also the EU communication strategy, but also the first legislative proposal for artificial intelligence in 2021. And we are now very happy that indeed globally there is a, already a big consensus that regulation is not only needed, but um, it is actually very important both to support innovation, uh, provide legal certainties how we deal with these challenges uh, with artificial intelligence, and also to provide a competitive market, trust, build trust, very important in both users, but also to society about uh, the, the effects of artificial intelligence, including to manage quite some of these risks um, that, were, that were mentioned. Um, and indeed, today is an important uh, day for the AI Act because uh, we've reached, uh, hopefully, the, one of the key milestones, final key milestones, when uh, the Council will review it. And then hopefully, uh, we wait also for the uh, Parliament um, and its uh, very soon adoption um, in spring. Um, and just maybe some elements how we tackled uh, some of the issues that were mentioned, how to both promote innovation, give legal certainty, but also at the same time uh, ensure proportionality, future proofness of the legal framework. So um, it really addresses the risks, but also uh, contributes to the competitiveness of the companies uh, and trust. Uh, the basis of our approach is indeed the risk-based approach. We tackle very specific uh, use cases with intended purposes, specific applications uh, as AI systems where there are very uh, important consequences for people's life safety with specific requirements um, such as data quality, um, as we know that it's quite important to avoid bias, ensure accuracy um, um, of, of the systems, um, but also general good practices, risk management, um, documentation, uh, so that uh, they are quite well also recognized um, uh, internationally. And we did also look into the, um, uh, to the basic uh, models as well, because uh, although we regulate mainly the applications, we indeed with generative AI and these large language models, we've seen that they are so important for the value chain, um, and they are one of the essential components, especially those that are um, uh, big and important and integrated in many applications. So um, indeed one of the key components during the legislative process has been to add uh, special rules for this uh, general purpose AI models, including generative AI. For uh, the most part of them, they are very light touch. 
um, and just uh, focus mainly on uh, documentation, transparency to ensure, uh, um, to facilitate the work of downstream providers of high-risk applications, but we do recognize also that there could be a very limited number also of uh, quite high impactful and very powerful models um, that could pose systemic risks uh, for the market and for them we do uh, also propose very proportionate and targeted rules that will be mainly implemented through code of conduct in a very collaborative manner with uh, scientific uh, community and all providers uh, of those models. All right. But th yes, and, and so what, what I'm hearing is kind of a, an understanding that, you know, op a open, you know, when we're doing this regulation, you know, we need to be thinking about how to do this proportionately to, you know, enhance, um, you know, both maybe open AI, open source AI and um, also at the same time kind of mitigate these risks. You know, thinking about maybe an historical perspective from the open source world, right? There was a lot of debate in the early days of open source around security, proliferation of cryptography, um, that um, you know the, the technology could get into the wrong hands. Um, you know, Arne O'Brien, uh, looking kind of backwards, what lessons might we learn from the as we think about you know the regulation that's happening here and then in the United States um, of open source and those types of concerns um, that we've seen. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into this first and then hand to Arno. Um, so I, uh, with due respect to the moderator, remember a, a moment when a certain uh, technology executive called open source a cancer upon the technology industry because it would eradicate the potential for profits from technology. Um, I don't think that quite happened. Uh, uh, this was 1999, 2000, I think something around those, that, that time frame. Instead, it drove an incredible economy of people building on top, right? Uh, uh, it, it was a boost. It was a way to build a common platform that was shared and allowed, uh, uh, are, are any of you uh, familiar with Cory Doctorow's term in shittification? Uh, apologies for, for this being recorded. Um, but I, I uh, it's, uh, it's the premise that sometimes platforms decay as the people who run the platforms extract value from them, right? Uh, open source doesn't have that phenomenon. Instead, you get increasing returns by more people participating in the platform and building value on top, right? Uh, that's what we saw in the early days of open source where the standardization of the Unix landscape on the Linux kernel allowed everybody to move up the stack and create more value in, in, in the cloud and other places and then repeated with the rise of Kubernetes, right? Meant that people could fight their competitive battles way up here where there was better uh, value proposition then on a Mac versus PC kind of battle down at the at the at the bottom. So uh, open source has helped uh, uh, equalize and and bring a lot more competition into the market for the benefit of everybody. And it has the chance to do that with AI as well, uh, as long as we don't kind of uh, uh, make a mistake. I, I think at the at the grassroots, there are also concerns about security. Right? If everybody can see the code, everybody can hack it, everybody can compromise it, uh, I, uh, or or if the development process was was, you know, a wild west, anybody could throw back doors into the code uh, and you couldn't trust it then. In fact, there are also concerns that if you gave people too much open source power when it came to cryptography, well then bad actors would be able to communicate securely without anybody being able to listen in on their conversations and keep bad things from happening, right? Uh, uh, some of you might even remember in the United States, you could not publish cryptography software more powerful than 128 bits uh, without getting, and, and, and ship it outside the United States without getting a permit from the United States government. Otherwise, you were considered an arms dealer. Uh, uh, and actually, in 99, uh, the Bernstein decision from the Supreme Court conclusively determined that open source software collaboration is an act of, of speech rather than an act of commerce and, and put it firmly on the side of the cryptographers and the software developers who then uh, developed things like OpenSSL and, and, and you know, secure sockets, uh, secure security into the Apache web server and all this great stuff. So, you know, history doesn't, doesn't necessarily repeat, but it sure does rhyme. Uh, and, uh, and looking at the current AI debates through this, we need to think about how do we allow for innovation upstream uh, and, and collaboration and freedom of expression and freedom of thought uh, and freedom of development upstream while holding folks at downstream accountable for their actions uh, at, as they deliver products and services to the end users, right? I think that's the right frame for us to understand kind of the history of, of, of open source and technology development uh, and frame it towards AI and also look at can we use open source as an enabler of uh, ways to address the kinds of harms and concerns that we all have, right? Uh, could we invest in digital public 
public goods in the form of data sets, in the form of software that could address AI fairness uh, concerns, in the form of uh, uh, you know, data sets focused on uh, addressing equity issues or equity concerns. Uh, can we move away from using Reddit comments <laughs> as training data? I don't know if any of you have read Reddit, but like, I don't, that's not how I want an AI to talk necessarily. <laughs> um, and uh, towards the kinds of things like the Allen Institute has some really great data sets that derive from the Wikipedia, derive from Project Gutenberg and others. Like, we can cultivate these things and build better AI by collaborating on the table stakes, on the stuff that is boring and the hard chop wood carry water <laughs> of, of building AI, better AI systems uh, and then uh, uh, allow interesting uh, commercial models on top of that. So I think what's interesting is looking back at what happened with open source is we learned over the years that there were clearly many different kinds of open source. And so you have a whole range. You can just you know, put your code out there and say, that's open source. Well, if there's the right license, that might be true. But the reality is there is more to it than that. Because what we learned is what's important is open governance, which means who controls this code, right? One of the things that we do, IBM works a lot with the Linux Foundation, for instance, because we have these foundations that have strict rules that provide this kind of open governance where there isn't a single company at the control of the, of the source code. The same is going to be true for AI. We see a lot of, uh, you know, models being distributed, but you don't know how they were built. You don't know what data was used behind it. And so we really need to go beyond this and have a true open collaboration environment that allows us to work in this environment with transparency so that we know what's behind those models, how they were built. And that's a very important thing we have learned from open source, which we need to adopt for AI. If, okay. If I could just build on that, I see Annie Lai in the audience here. Um, Annie is part of the uh, Linux Foundation's AI and Data Project, one of the um, products of which is uh, something that's emerging called the Model Openness Framework. It's not an attempt to define open source AI or to change licensing terms. It's a way to say those 500,000 models on Hugging Face, how might you categorize them in terms of degrees of openness, degrees of uh, uh, how much can you really fork, you know, in the way that open source licenses allow us to fork. Uh, it's, it's a way of recognizing licensing around data is super complicated, but how might we bend the industry towards greater openness? Uh, and so there, we're going to need new tools to help us understand uh, this different landscape, and this is one that I just wanted to highlight. And so one thing I also wanted to add is from a regulation point of view, and it also has to do with th efforts like OSI on defin defining what uh, open source AI really is. I mean, one of the challenges we have is that if you if you're too high level, it becomes moot. It doesn't have any meaning or usefulness. If you go too much into the detail, you quickly corner yourself. In a world where you know, this technology evolves so fast, if you look at the AI Act, I think they have actually so far found a right balance of keeping it at a fairly high level so they have principles-oriented uh, uh, regulation. Because if we look at GDPR, for instance, I'm a strong supporter of GDPR, I think it it did some good, but at the same time, I worked in blockchain along with Brian for several years, and the problem with GDPR, it went too down far into the detail of the architecture of the database system based on some traditional architecture where you have control points. And when we worked on blockchain, we realized, well, it didn't work anymore because we don't have single control points. And so the danger with regulation is to go too far into the details. And so far, again, I think the AI Act does a good job at finding the right balance, keeping it high-level principle. What we need to make sure now is the next phase is going to be to develop standards that further define how this is going to be implemented. And we need to be on the lookout to not fall into that uh, uh, you know, uh, mechanism again of going too far into the details. Keeping in mind that you know, the AI Act has been in the works for several years already, it's going to take two years from the publication to be fully enforceable. It's going to take several years for the standards bodies to define the standards that will be used to implement it. Meanwhile, I mean, the industry is going full on developing the, the, the technology in ways that we cannot predict, honestly. 
We already see it in ISO, JTC1. There are some standards that have been in the works for a while. They are already a bit obsolete because they're missing major components that just weren't there when they started. It's not f nobody's fault. It just goes too fast. And so I think this is a true challenge as a society is to find the right balance. When is it too soon? When is it too late? That's hard. Go ahead. Yeah, just w w one uh, com a comment or, or, or thought. Uh, I, I think that uh, it is not only industry or big industry going ahead. I, I, I see this, and, and this is what I'm enthusiastic to be here, that there are a lot of happening, uh, the small scale, big scale everywhere, and then the question of data and, uh, and good quality data. I wanted to bring the, the uh, example of the small language group. I know Linus speaks the same than me, uh, so Finnish. We are 5.5 million, not that much interested of the good training from the big uh, workers. So uh, then uh, there is a known model that uses the national library uh, digitalized things that has been going on for 20 years, then uses the supercomputers partly sponsored by EU. I have to advertise the Lumi uh, being the GPQ graphics possibility to count that the university has been collected, the national broadcasting company has been curated data and they do it perfectly as the AI Act wishes that this is the sources of data that we are using, this is the, the open possibility for everyone to do it. So maybe even other languages in Europe might do the same, so that it's not one way only, that everything later will be dependent on the couple of players in the world, but then you can uh, use the different uh, systems and develop. So now it's the Finnish science uh, involved in that one and, and, and very happy to see this happening. So also we have to see that there is much more happening than the, the most uh, common systems and the biggest ones. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm loving this discussion because what, what I'm pulling out from it um, as, I'm, as I'm standing here is that you know, the, the governance systems and, and collaboration of open source really matters. And participation in that um, innovation cycle is what's being enabled by, you know, wide open governance and, and participation, um, you know, as we, as we think through that. And so, you know, one, one, we were just kind of talking a little bit about, you know, control um, in, in, in these models. And I, maybe just to, to kind of throw some concepts together on that, right? So licensing, we're seeing a compression of the licensing innovation we've seen over the last 40 years into one um, for AI models where we have licenses that are trying to restrict uses for ethical purposes on the one hand, and then we have other ones that are restricting uh, competition if you use their model um, on the other, Falcon, Llama 2 being ones um, in that area. Um, and at the same time, there's a question about what um, elements of the model need to be there so you can have this, you know, open source uh, participation that we were just we were just talking about. So, you know, with that in mind, Steph, um, what is the importance of OSI's work driving an open definition, and what's what's at stake if we don't slice that definition right when we have um, you know regulations kind of referring to free and open source models? Right. So, well, one one thing that I I like to remember is how open source as a definition and the principles behind it have been evolving or have been a guidance to the evolution of software itself for many years, and I think that for the, my wishful thinking, my, my hope, my secret hope, is to, to, to have the same sort of principles established quickly so that the AI space can, uh, can evolve together, uh, having a framework reference that, that carries the value of collaboration, permissionless evolution, the, the, the fact that we can, we can immediately, the, the communities of developers, creators of AI, and, and other stakeholders, have an immediate understanding of what they can do and what they cannot do, what they should do, what they should not do uh, when it comes to downloading an AI system, modifying it and putting it back on the market together with regulators. Of course, because I, I, I am quite sure that we have, uh, software has told us already, we've gone beyond the, the times when we could just deploy something, putting it on the market and say, if it breaks, you keep the pieces. I, th I think it's fair to think that 
as we have responsibilities as humans, creators of anything, when we put it on, on the outside, we should think twice uh, about what we're doing and why, you, you know, and how it can be, uh, we can enable abuse uh, and things like that. It, it, it's not the role of the open source initiative to, to think about those things, but it's the role of me as a human <laughs> to keep that in mind in general. And it, you know, you asked uh, what, it, what happens if we get it wrong. I don't think that there is much of a chance to get it wrong as much as there is a risk of getting it late uh, or not getting it at all. Uh, in, because li like you mentioned, there, is, there, is many, there are many licenses, and there are many models and, and new licenses are emerging and everyone is uh, starting you know, on the market to advertise their, their models, their AI systems as open source without that shared understanding. And so the, the, the effort that, that I'm doing is, that we're doing with the OSI is to, to build that shared understanding among different stakeholders. That unfortunately takes, takes time, but I'm really pushing everyone to, to come to a, a solid agreement because I think that we all instinctively know what that means. Uh, you know, we need to be able to use, we need to be able to share, to study and, and modify systems. And, and now we need to very quickly come to uh, uh, practic the practicalities. And what, what is that we need to do? What, you know, the open source, the free software definition says you need access to source code in order to study and modify uh, a program. Well, we need to, the equivalent of that little sentence for AI systems. And I think we're getting very close to understand that. Excellent. Now, um, uh, the, the EU AI Act uh, that I guess is being voted on today, very exciting, um, provides a, you know, an exception uh, to some of the regulation um, accounting for open source development. And that, that exception uh, happens when uh, the power of the model is be below some threshold, number one. And number two, when the models are made accessible to the public, and I'm quoting here, under a free and open source license that allows for the access, usage, modification, and distribution of the model, and whose parameters, including the weights, the information on the model, architecture, and information on model usage are made publicly available. Um, does this get it right? Does this promote in innovation the way we might, might like? Anything missing? Uh, Arno, I'll start with you, Steph, so, uh, and others. So again, I think they, 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 they get it right in the sense that it's pretty high level. They focus on use cases as opposed to you know, trying to regulate the technology itself. So from that point of view, it's good. Of course, this threshold, you know, they measure it in flops. They say, oh, th it seems pretty arbitrary and it's bound to be broken, so it will have to be revised. But I think, again, this is part of this challenge of, you know, we, you have to start somewhere and when is the right time to regulate is very difficult. I think in general, uh, they are doing the right thing for now. We'll have to keep up and make sure it doesn't derail. Maybe if I can compliment, indeed, it's been quite challenging to regulate so fast developments and also many unknowns. Uh, so um, for those very powerful uh, general purpose AI models with systemic risks, indeed, there has been one threshold now set, but we've also tried to build a system that allows enough flexibility to take into account developments, adapt, but also develop performance benchmarked on the future, the more we see how it develops, how it performs in a collaborative process to keep it future proof because it's, we have to catch up always with the regulation and the technological development and that was the, the right way we, we thought we can do it uh, together with uh, the industry, community um, and indeed quite importantly I think the AI Act right, is one of the first EU legislation that tries to at least set some principles what these open source uh, uh, AI models can be exempted from the obligation. So it's truly open source and we have a shared understanding what kind of transparency we do need for those models uh, to benefit from these exceptions because they have already ensured the necessary level and we think that this indeed promotes a lot of um, transparency in the community as a whole but also collaborative development. Developments. And in any case, I just also wanted to say that the AI Act would 
not apply to models that would be solely for research purposes, development, prototyping, so that's quite important. We do want to make sure that innovation, research, and there is no burden at all or unintended consequences on the overall open source community. And uh, finally, uh, another important point I would also like to make is that the AI office, which will be uh, uh, now created, and actually it was uh, the decision for its cr um, uh, creation was, uh, was adopted um, in anticipation of the AI Act implementation. Um, it will have a, an important role of, to be exclusively competent for the supervision of general purpose AI models, but we also try to make sure that the codes of practices uh, 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 that we are going to develop to operationalize these high-level principles, as mentioned, are developed together with the whole community, all providers, including open source providers, and in this decision uh, that was just adopted for the creation of the AI office, quite importantly, also, we also commit to create a special forum for collaboration with the open source community because we do recognize and do we want to promote a uh, strong ecosystem and uh, build innovation in AI. Um, one of the most important elements uh, that we also see is that one of the biggest uh, and, uh, players in the EU are now actually open source models and we do think that the community can build compared to other bigger players outside the EU now could allow this collaborative development, access to all EU resources, uh, supercomputers, to, to help uh, EU startups uh, and SMEs build competitive models uh, uh, and also uh, align with, with our approaches. And one uh, cool thing about Europe is that I think it has a lot of the legislative elements that, that are necessary for a good AI. Uh, there is GDPR managing all the privacy data. Uh, there is um, a right to data mining that has been established in the copyright directive and, and the AI Act on top of it. I, I think all the elements are in there. Uh, of course, everything can be improved and perfected, but um, you know, the, it, it's a testament to the, the innovation that has been happening also on the governance side. Justin, can I jump yeah, in? Yeah, please. Um, this is very encouraging to hear. I hadn't followed the last few iterations to the trilogue, so um, there's a balancing act as it preserves the right kind of space for open source, but there's a different kind of balancing act that uh, in the United States, uh, the Biden administration's AI policy tried to strike as well, which was between throttling and restricting and containing versus enabling and steering and encouraging in the right directions. And in the, in the Biden uh, AI policy, uh, which has not been a funded uh, pass set of laws or anything yet, um, probably won't be in this uh, current cycle but I, 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 there was a proposal to put a, chief AI officers inside of every government agency, right, to drive AI adoption plans so that uh, uh, the IT offices are taking maximal use of this, to develop data sets from uh, government data that can be used to drive the development of LLMs for domain-specific purposes in science and engineering, in, in, uh, in the health administrations, and the Veterans Administration, those sorts of things. And this kind of capacity building is coming at a very challenging time. You can't hire... <laughs> enough AI talent to fill all of the roles that it called for without um, completely bursting the budgets that normally are put towards government uh, uh, employees. But uh, I, this is an important, uh, really, really angle on this. How might pub the public sector become a stakeholder in these technologies, develop an internal capacity for adopting these, and in doing so, be, be a part of steering it in, a, in the directions that address many of the uh, harms that people are concerned about out there? have to add here that uh, the Data Act was the, the final one, the finalized that all the public created data should be available, even the uh, sensitive one with the second use data from Finland from health was the kind of model thinking there that how to get access to the public data to be able to use it and train it. So that is not news anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the yellow light that we're almost at time. And so what I'd, what I'd like to do for, for the last question is kind of just say, you know, there's a, there's a signal that there's a, from the EU AI Act and from our conversation today, that there's a perceived public benefit to um, open source AI. And so thinking, um, you know, more broadly, looking forward, we've seen that open source has shaped innovation over the last 20, 30 years. Um, globally, um, thinking about Europe, thinking about the United States, thinking about the globe, how do we think 
um, what's the hope for how open source AI might, um, you know, might, might shape the industry and, and the world moving forward? Steph, I'm going to start with you and we'll go down the, to the end. Well, thank you. Uh, I, my, my hope um, is that we find legal frameworks that work across the globe as soon as possible to cover two things specifically. One is the nature, the legal nature of weights, parameters, anything that goes after the training, that, that's created up by the training. That I think is something that I, I'd love to, to, see, um, to see defined because, and defined at a global level. And uh, together with uh, the cl clarification about data mining, uh, because I, the, 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 two, the thing that open source had built upon was the, the Berne Convention. So the, the fact that there is a copyright law or droit d'auteur uh, more or less very similarly applied in many parts of the world allows for this open source to be a global phenomenon. In, in, uh, in AI, given the fact that we have data and we have these new artifacts, that are, uh, the model weights, model parameters, requires new legal frameworks, and my wish is that we quickly get to the point where we have a global understanding of what these permissions are, what is allowed, what is not allowed, so that innovation can really happen in the same way that open source has. Arno? So quickly, one thing I want to say is that, you know, I see a lot of effort in Europe. There is this reaction, oh, we need to have a European initiative to promote you know, whatever initiative is, and in this case, open source AI. But what I find unfortunate is often it translates into we need to start a European focused effort, which in fact comes into competition with other global efforts. In, and this is a, a misunderstanding of how you can actually influence the, the global efforts by actually contributing. In, the influence is in the people who actually work in those organizations. Most of them, like the, many of the Linux Foundation organizations, are completely open with an open governance. You just have to show up. And so I really want to encourage European companies to do that. I, I do hope that the AI Act uh, contributes uh, both to innovation, legal certainty development, including for the open source community, but also responsible, trustworthy AI. And we've seen a lot of good practices and uh, we'll continue to, to work together with the community, including uh, for the early implementation of the AI Act uh, through initiatives we launched, like the AI Pact with companies uh, and the AI Office. And we do recognize also that one of the key focus now should be to work together and we do with international partners to ensure this convergence and common understanding and we do so in OECD, uh, UN, with trade technology and bilateral partnerships so that's very important focus for us now. My hope is that open source is recognized as a, a way to address two of the biggest sources of, of uh, risk in the uh, adoption of AI technologies. One of those is the concentration of market power. Um, I, I, open source has been about decentralizing that power by allowing uh, technology, enabling technologies and platforms to be available to, uh, to anybody who is willing to pick them up and adopt them. And a lot of the risks that, that are articulated out there come from uh, unequal application of that power. What happens if one company moves too quickly, or, or if the rest of us are, sub are able to use AI, but only through an API, where the interesting stuff is on the other side of that API. The Linux Foundation recently published a, uh, a, a survey on generative AI, where we talked to the top IT leaders and asked them, how do you want to use this? Every single one of them wants to look behind the API. They want to have a model, uh, the ability to build their models, correct their models, modify the data underneath it, understand how it works, and adapts it, adapt it to their organization's needs, the kind of thing you can only do with open source. The second part of this, though, in addressing AI harms is, to some degree, to fight fire with fire. Let's talk about misinformation, right? Using, using content labeling techniques like C2PA to identify authentic photographs, authentic documents, to try to fight misinformation is an incredibly important project. C2PA is a standards effort that's uh, part of the Linux Foundation, but, but very much uh, integrated into many open source projects. Uh, uh, but uh, being able to, to, to use that, uh, and, and, and it, another angle to this, though, is, you know, we've been fighting spam with AI technologies for 20 years. Anyone who's used Vipple's Razor or other anti-spam tools know that it kind of builds its filters out of studying databases of known spam. 
in order to fight misinformation, we will need AI tools, very local to the end user, to be able to help them navigate the flood of information, of false information, find the signal uh, in that noise, and navigate that more intelligently. That's just one example of where AI could be used to fight many of the harms that many of us are concerned about arising from AI, and that only is possible if those tools are broadly available, thanks to open source. Hey, Petra? Yeah, I, I've been 10 years now in the parliament, nine and a half. So the first mandate was a very critical infrastructure, how to reach everyone, no, no one left behind, how to get the 5G, to get the trusted networks. And so this mandate so much on the data, data availability, the content. And then we read in the end of this term that the uh, World Economic Foundation is saying that it is the disinformation that is the biggest threat. So then uh, it is where and how and for what use the technology. Is there some room for democratic decision making? And, and I'm sorry, the Europeans need to also look at the European jobs and European well-being, which is, uh, I hope, uh, I'm the one uh, speaking in favor of the data movements globally and, and, and uh, having uh, these ideas. Yeah, it takes two to tango, but the, the good competition is always better for the markets and solutions, but then also uh, monopolistic structures very seldom are good, and that's why also how to build on uh, other possibilities, it's open question. Open source being so far so good challenger. I always welcome the challengers for the uh, making the broad uh, possibility that is called market economy. I haven't seen better ones. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why I keep on uh, working for these opportunities for everyone. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody. This was a really engaging, wonderful panel with lots of strong participation. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks everybody for, for having us. Thank you.